Welcome to lesson two for functional annotation. Today we're going to talk about inferring function from homologous matches. Um, talk about the limits of using orthologs to match uh, your query sequences um, against some database and, and uh, moving some function onto the uh, sequence that you're working with. And specifically we'll talk about some tools that are involved in this process, including uh, the very common BLAST and Diamond, and then have a tutorial that explicitly walks through how you would use both of those tools. So in lesson one, uh, we discussed uh, the NCBI PGAP pipeline, the prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline, where we looked at uh, this step where we predicted open reading frames and converted those open reading frames into proteins. Uh, in this week's lesson, lesson two, uh, we will uh, approach this from a point of view of looking at uh, BLAST-P, um, which or BLAST, which is BLAST plus, sorry, uh, which is their uh, tool for uh, um, comparing your query sequences against some database um, and performing homology homology based predictions. Uh, lesson three will cover this side of the um, pipeline where we're going to use um, position sensitive models to assign functionality. So the first thing that we uh, need to cover is that homology uh, does not equal similarity in function. And there's a, a biological reason for this. And so in this example, uh, we have a fairly classic uh, rundown of uh, gene duplication events uh, that you might see in a, a, a beginning bio biology textbook, where we have some pre-ancestry globin uh, gene, globin protein, uh, the precursor to uh, modern day hemoglobin that are present, present in metazoans. And at some point in history, uh, there's a gene duplication event, and you end up uh, generating a protein um, that is called the alpha chain and the beta chain. And so each of these chains, uh, while important for de, uh, hemoglobin, actually um, have their own functionality to them. And so you need two alpha chains and two beta chains uh, to make a functioning hemoglobin model uh, molecule. But at the end of the day, uh, each the alpha chain and the beta chain actually have different functionalities. And so what happens is, is that when you compare uh, through evolutionary history, uh, the beta chains to each other, they look very similar at a primary sequence level. And when you compare the alpha chains to each other, they look occur very similarly um, across organisms um, in a very similar way. But at the same time, when you compare A and B, because they came from the same starting uh, gene, uh, they actually also still look very similar to each other. And so, uh, they might look similar to each other, but they have these different functions. And so we call this uh, duplication event and then followed by uh, conservation of functionality. Uh, a, the group of proteins that have a conserved function and that are coming from the same uh, duplication or same, coming from the same uh, uh, protein uh, origin uh, are identified as orthologs. So they have the same functionality and they look like each other. Uh, we can see that there's an alpha version of this and a beta version as an example. And that when you have two things that come from the same uh, a gene duplication event, uh, but that um, have different functionalities and look similar to each other, we call these paralogs. And so we might actually say uh, in, a, in a limited database with limited knowledge, we could maybe make a comparison where we took this alpha uh, um, chain gene, compared it to the mouse uh, genome itself, and had this match against the beta chain, and we would maybe ascribe this functionality uh, to the alpha chain, which would be incorrect. And so broadly, what we're doing when we do these searches of similarity uh, at primary sequence level is we're identifying homologs, but uh, homology doesn't necessarily always lead uh, to conservation of functionality for this very reason. So there's no biological truth uh, in homology, uh, just uh, biolog biological testing that we can go do going forward. And so with enough modification, if we change the gap scores um, and we lower our threshold of similarity, um, any pair of sequences can be aligned. And so it might not look good, uh, but we can forcibly do that to happen. And then one of the things that's particularly uh, problematic uh, for uh, protein sequences in general, is that you can have things like this where you can have proteins that are 80% similar to each other um, that have the same function. So they basically look like they're different proteins but have the same functionality. And then on the flip side, you can have proteins that look almost identical to each other uh, but that have different functions. And so these can also lead to problems uh, bore out by this 
paralog orthologue uh, scenario. And so because of this, context of your matches really is important, right? So it might not just be one match is enough uh, to determine uh, if this is a, if your functional assignment is correct, you're going to want to put that in context of, of the rest of your sequence that you're looking at. So again, we're saying that homology and similarity uh, and function aren't always the same. We actually can uh, expand that to the databases that we're using um, and how this uh, problem persists uh, in the database that, that, that we have. So we, this is the first one that we talked about just in that last slide. So paralogs are a problem. You have your query, it matches a template, but the template's actually a paralog. So it actually has a function that's different from what the query sequence is. You can have what they call the moonlighting problem, where you have a query that matches a template. Uh, and that template then has multiple functions assigned to it. And so in some instances, the most you know, common occurrence of that functionality might be what is uh, linked to this template, but that in your particular organism of interest, it's secondary function, it might be what it's performing, right? And so in that instance, you would think one thing is happening, but something else actually is what's happening in, in your organism of interest. You have this multi-domain problem where proteins are made up of multiple domains. And so you can have a query, which might be short in nature, match some domain on your template, uh, but then not match the rest of the domains that are present there. And so the conserved functionality might only be in this particular domain match, uh, but the function that might be ascribed to your template might involve all of the domains that are present here. So all of a sudden you're taking something that's much more complex and assigning it to your query, which is fairly limited in scope in terms of its ability um, to predict its function from something. And then lastly, and this is very important, is that our databases are filled with crap. Um, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. But what here happens here is you have your query, uh, you get a template. The template in history was misassigned, maybe because of one of these other problems, uh, translating back a functionality of something that it doesn't belong to. So in this instance, we have uh, this problem extended further. So that you have uh, your uh, multi-domain uh, problem influencing what your template's assigned to, but then your query matches the template and you're only checking this. And so that gets assigned back to your query. So if the template's wrong, your query is wrong, and now you're not getting the right sequence. And so uh, this uh, database rot is something that's very common. Um, a lot of times institutions like NCBI are trying to manage this at all times. Um, and you'll have very large sweeps that go through that change annotations. Uh, but it's, it can be very hard because it's a user-based facility uh, to police that all the time. So we're going to talk about a specific tool uh, today, uh, a couple of tools. Uh, the one that we're going to talk about and is maybe common to a lot of people in their first forays into bioinformatics is BLAST, uh, which is, stands for Blo uh, Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. This is the Wikipedia definition. So it's an algorithm for comparing primary biological sequence information, uh, such as amino acid sequences and proteins and nucleotide sequences and DNAs. And so this is a really generic version of what you might see with a BLAST result, uh, where you uh, have matches represented by uh, the same nucleotide and linked by a line and a, pos a positive uh, score here, a mismatch where the nucleotides don't match up and a negative, and then some inclusion of a gap where in order to locally align a sequence, we have to introduce a gap to one of the sequences to make sure that that alignment happens. This local alignment is what makes BLAST useful, but at the same time can have problems. So if we had tried to globally align sequence one with sequence two, it would not be possible after this step because what we'd be asking is the A to match up here, this G to match up here, this C to match up here, and this G to match up here, which actually does have a pretty high level of, uh, of, of similarity, but breaks down as you go further into the sequence. And so within BLAST, there are a number of programs uh, that do different things. So we have uh, BLASTN and BLASTP, which people might be familiar with, which are for nucleotide to nucleotide uh, comparisons and protein to protein comparisons, respectively. And then we have a number of, of, of tools that basically take uh, translated uh, sequences. So a nucleotide sequence that gets translated in all six reading frames into a protein and then compared to a protein sequence itself. So BLASTX compares um, an input nucleotide to a protein database. TBLASTN takes a protein and compares it to a nucleotide database. And then TBLASTX uh, compares uh, a nucleotide input to a nucleotide input in protein space. And so I would argue that nowadays, uh, these types of tools actually function, have much less of a functionality than they did uh, in the early days of genomics when really what you were dealing with uh, were software tools that didn't accurately predict open reading frames like we talked about in lesson one. You might be looking at all ORFs over the stretch of a, a protein 
or, or over a sequence, and then using that information um, in the blast hit uh, to determine if it's a real gene or not, as opposed to uh, determining that um, de novo like we did in lesson one. Um, and so uh, a lot of these times, these types of data, uh, um, comparisons aren't really required anymore, and for, especially in, in microbial um, analyses. It's different for eukaryotes. And, and one of the things that's good about this is that um, when you compare nucleotides to nucleotides or proteins to proteins, it's a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, you compare each protein to all of the proteins in your database, but it's just protein-protein space. When you input a nucleotide and translate it into um, proteins, now you have to make six comparisons for every one entry. So in this instance, for the uh, query sequence, you have six queries per protein that you're comparing against. In the TBLAST-N situation, you then have to compare each protein to six translations of the nucleotide in the database. And then if you have this comparison in TBLAST-X, when you start with nucleotides on both, translate into six reading frames, um, you have a lot more comparison. So you go from a, a 1x computation time to 36 times more time required to make these comparisons. And so BLAST, works in a, uh, a very specific way. Uh, and, and the tools that have come from BLAST since um, also work in a, in a similar manner. And if you have a chance and you wanna learn more about um, how this works, um, you should check out uh, Lesson 2 in Metagenomics by Eric Collins, where we talk, he talks about uh, KMER sizes and what KMERs are used for. Um, so in this sense, what we're using is a word size of 11 base pairs or a KMER, or a KMER of a, a, a 11 base pairs. Um, to uh, start as a seed, which we then compare to our database, which has some uh, reward and penalty schema. Uh, we add up those scores based off of matches and mismatches. And then we set some threshold, which we do uh, when we're um, both in the uh, web interface, when we're running on the command line, we'll normally set a threshold of what we wanna see. Any of the matches that come back from that then get um, uh, kept. Um, and then we build outwards from the seed to generate the overall alignment. And so in this instance, the alignment stays pretty good. And so upstream of the seed match is almost a direct one-to-one -one match. Downstream of the seed, downstream of the seed match, uh, you get to have a little bit more variation. Uh, we would take this overall match and then score it and compare it to all the other scores and then provide that back as an output. And that's how we would get our, our various blast matches back. There are also a number of other uh, default settings that you can run within BLAST, including things like BLAST N short, which is optimized for short sequences, Mega Blast, which is optimized for sequences with high similarity, DC Mega Blast, which is optimized for the opposite, and then equivalence in, in the BLAST P protein space. So here uh, we have um, two. Uh, query sequences being compared to two query subject or two subject sequences, where we have HSP high scoring pairs between the words that we have initially looked at in, in protein space. And so what you're seeing here is, is one of those kind of common outputs that you can have an issue with, where some seed in your query one matches both subject two and subject one. And so if you're trying to assign a functionality, uh, to your query one and subject one and subject two had different assigned functions, it might be difficult to understand why this is happening or how it's happening or how to actually reconcile that. Um, this can have a lot to do with uh, what we discussed before with uh, very, especially in protein space of various domains um, being representative of a functionality that's conserved that might not necessarily represent the whole protein. Here in uh, query two, you have a, a number of HSPs that match uh, subject to, uh, but maybe upstream, we don't have the right information here that matches that. And this might give you a little bit more confidence, especially if these lengths were much longer, uh, that this was an actual match that you could then translate backwards that functionality to. One of the other things that's pretty common that you can run into uh, is uh, the difference between a continuous match and a discontinuous match. And so here we have a query matching three subjects where the alignment uh, is pretty robust over some length of uh, of sequence, but maybe isn't the full the full query isn't sub uh, um, isn't covered. Um, to exacerbate this problem, you can have dis discontinuous matches where you have a query and you have a subject being hit in multiple regions again without some some missing elements that might be not conserved over the full length. And so one of the things that you commonly see people do uh, when you are using blast matches is to set some type of parameter. Uh, where we screen things based off of how much of a match we get, normally based off of length. 
right? And so you can see this happening um, at various levels of cutoff, depending on what we're trying to capture. Domains, it might be very short. Full sequence, uh, full protein matches might be very long. And so we can set that and say, well, we actually need the query to cover 70% of a subject for us to actually consider that annotation to be uh, accurate, right? And so those are something that we can, we should be aware of. Just because you get a match, because BLAST works locally, uh, you can end up with a situation where um, that BLAST match doesn't actually represent your full query sequence. And then lastly, I just want to talk about some of the other alternatives to local alignment tools, specifically BLAST, which, I'm, uh, which was uh, created in 1990, and then some of the more recent developments like USEARCH, which was uh, built and released in 2010, and Diamond, which was released in 2015, both which increased the speed at which you can perform these alignments. And so BLAST only supports local alignments. By default, its E values cutoff is 10, which is very, very, very high and has a very high error rate because of that. So if you were to, you might have seen this where if you run a sequence, a protein sequence that doesn't have a match uh, in a database, you'll get back, especially in the uh, interface on the internet, you'll get back these like low score black bars that really match completely randomly different things. Um, and and BLAST is, is trying to give you some hit back but that might not necessarily be worthwhile. Um, uh, BLAST is what's considered an all mapper where your query sequence is compared to your database and it's trying to find the best match um, across all of that database. So it'll give you back, um, you can limit this, but you can get, it will give you back as many matches as it can. And then lastly, um, because of uh, the way it works, um, you have to explicitly index your database that you're searching against um, um, to make sure that BLAST runs correctly. Uh, in comparison, USEARCH uh, supports both local and global alignments, and so BLAST uses local alignments. A global alignment might be useful for something where you want to make sure that the whole sequence aligns correctly, and this might be useful some for something like a 16S rRNA search, where you can have small regions, like the hypervariable regions, that might lo uh, line locally, but when you actually put the full length of sequence in and you want to find a, a good match across the full length, you need that global alignment. You're not trying to tease local regions that are the best match, you need to have that full sequence considered. USEARCH has multiple tools within it as well, where you can use USEARCH for uh, matches that are, are high identity, and UBLAST, which is a little slower and sensitive to lower identities. Um, and one of the ways that USEARCH increases its speed uh, is by returning fewer high quality matches. So it is not an all mapper like BLAST and Diamond is. It, it goes through the database, it finds high quality matches and returns those high quality matches. But once it's found, found those high quality matches, it doesn't continue to look through the rest of the database. So Diamond is estimated to be about 20,000 times faster than BLAST. And this comes directly from the Diamond paper. It has a similar level of sensitivity to BLAST. And I highlight that similar because it means it's not identical. And one of the things that's very common in bioinformatics tools is that you can have a tool that runs faster, but a lot of the times that trade-off in speed comes with a trade-off in accuracy and sensitivity to detect true positives. The way that Diamond, one of the ways that Diamond is faster is it constructs, constructs a double index so that the index, so not only are you indexing your database, but you're indexing your query. So you have that comp uh, component. Like BLAST, it's an all mapper, so it gives you all matches, um, and then you have to, are required to format your own database uh, for it. In the tutorial, we'll go over how to run BLAST and Diamond for a, a set of sequences. And with that, I'll conclude lesson two. Please come back for lesson three, uh, where we'll talk about predicting function using positive or position sensitive models uh, to determine uh, functionality. Thank you.